The early histories of World of Warcraft is oftentimes what one can describe as a bit messy. Chris Mason and his ilk would write these incredible stories with a lot of plot holes. These plot holes were, I believe, strategic. They left them there so that they had movement to write stories, rewrite stories, and oftentimes redcon stories as they saw fit. This is why our topic for today, the Dragonflights and their connection to modern day World of Warcraft is so interesting because while there is a lot known about the Dragonflights and the aspects, there is a hell of a lot that is guesswork, rumored, and sometimes just not there. Which of course, it might be messy, but that's where speculation is so incredible. Within those plot holes lies our opportunity to think bigger, bolder, to dream about what the future could be. Ladies and gentlemen, my name of course is Akalon, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for watching this. If you enjoy these types of videos, please hit the like button, hit that subscribe button, write some stupid shit in the comment section down below. Remember, you can join me live on Twitch. Hit the link in the description down below. If you are a patron or a YouTube channel member of the channel, thank you so much for your support. More on how to support the channel at the end of the video. True Heralds of the End Times. In order to get to the end times, we have to go back to the beginning. A little bit of a history lesson, if you will. And we start, of course, with the father of all dragons, Mr. Galakrond himself, the original proto-dragon, the dragon that would strike fear into the heart of Azeroth with every single breath he drew. But Galakrond didn't start off as this fearsome creature, no. Galakrond was a proto-drake, and in fact, there were many just like him. The list of proto-drakes is so long that I had to write it down. You have the blue-green proto-drakes, the blue-white proto-drakes, the orange proto-drakes, the yellow proto-drakes, the charcoal-gray proto-drakes, the dust-brown proto-drakes, the silver proto, the gold, the copper, the silver-green, the not living, not undead, not living. You have the blue, the green, the bronze, the black, the Plagued Violet and Ironbound, Ironbound, which came later. But the original ancient, ancient types were many. Their colors varied slightly, sometimes, sometimes a little bit more. But it is from these ancient proto-dragons that the original dragonflights were born. Now, before we even start talking about what exactly happened with Galakrond, let's discuss a little bit, you know, let's shift our focus just a, a tad to the cosmological map. Now, you guys know this is one of my favorite maps in World of Warcraft. And of course, it stands between the elemental planes and the cosmological forces. In the explanations that we've been given by Steve Denuser himself, as well as in the story, the Elemental Planes is sort of the origin. It's the building blocks of the universe. On top of that comes the cosmological forces, which is the high forces of the universe. In other words, the Elemental Planes is sort of the, the carbon of the universe and out of this carbon, everything else is created. Now, in order to understand this, we have to shift our focus even a little bit more, zoom out a little bit more on this map to the clockmaker and the first ones. One can look at the elemental planes versus the cosmological forces as the clockmaker developed and designed the elemental planes. He, he gave the elements to the universe. The first ones, for their part, developed the cosmological forces from these elemental planes, the high powers, as it were, the, the cognizant, powers, the powers that would ultimately shape the universe around them. Now, if you want to understand how this works, and if you don't quite believe me, just look at the chain of command. The first ones created all of the cosmological forces. The Titans, for their part, order the creation of the cosmological forces and also the creation of the first ones. The Titan Keepers, the Watchers, order and organize the worlds that the Titans themselves order and organize. So it is sort of a chain of command where the sons and daughters do what the mothers and fathers did before them, only not as good not as optimally. So that's sort of, you have to understand this to understand the next part of the theory. Now, remember, a lot of this is speculation because a lot of this isn't directly answered. We've never been told why exactly Galakrond went insane. We know that Galakrond at some point 
were, was hungry and decided that a dead protodrake looked particularly tasty on this specific day. On this fateful day, as Galakron takes a bite from this protodrake, Galakron realized something. He's growing stronger. And not just because he feels full and he's finally eaten. No, he is absorbing the literal lifeblood of the protodrake that he had consumed. This, of course, led leads Galakron down a pretty dark path. Let's be real, cannibalism is never a sexy tale. But Galakron starts feasting on proto-drakes pretty much exclusively, growing larger and larger by the day. It also transforms his flesh, making him a monstrosity to behold. In fact, Galakron eventually grows so big that it is said that when he flies, he darkens the land below. This is not a small dragon, this is a massive dragon. In fact, his breath eventually, and this is where our speculation really starts to take shape, his breath reanimates the proto-drake corpses that lie next to him. The only way he could do that is if there was some kind of infusion by one of the cosmological forces, and we know which one that is, right? Death. Death had, had to be present. Now, if the proto-drakes, as it were, were purely elemental forces, nothing more, nothing less, then Galakron should not have had this ability. The ability to reanimate the, the dead should not have been part of his toolkit. But like I said, if indeed the elements are simply the building box blocks of the universe, then the correct amount of elements in certain quantities will ultimately lead to the cosmological forces. Two parts of one, one part of the other makes foul. One part of one, three parts of the other makes death and so on and so forth. So really, this is not a new speculation for the channel. We've speculated on this before. But this is what I believe happened to Galakrond. I believe that by consuming all of these protodrakes, Galakrond eventually became the culmination of every single one of the cosmological forces. And I believe that two very specific forces were present within Galakrond. Fell and Void. Why? It is said that Galakrond's hunger became insatiable. He no longer ate till he was full. He was never full. He would consume everything and anything he saw. This was the fear that Tyr and the other Watchers had. If Galakrond keeps consuming, he will ultimately consume Azeroth herself. And that's why he had to be stopped. Now, we know exactly two cosmological forces that operate in this manner. That is, never satiated and always need more. The Void and the Fell. These two, the Fell build engines that burn millions upon millions of souls every single day in order to fuel their war machines. The foul is never satiated. The void is literally the void. Whatever you throw in it, it's almost never going to make it full. So Galakrond must have had one or both of these entities within it. And considering that his hunger is literally described as insatiable, I'm going to go with both were probably present. This is where we get to the story of the dragonflight. Now, eventually, Tyr picks five dragons to help him take down Galakrond. These would become known as the dragonflight. Now, the story of the dragonflight is actually something that's very interesting because you have the five normal dragonflights that we're all pretty much used to at this point. You have the red, the blue, the green, the blonde, bronze, and black. These are the original five. But then remember, you also have the lesser dragonflights. The Infinite, the Chromatic, the Plague, the Netherwing, Twilight, Storm, Thoringer, or Thorin, uh, Thorignur, and Nightmare. Now, of course, all of the lesser ones were created. Some of them were created by Deathwing. Some of them were created just by chance. But all of them were ultimately created. Doesn't mean that there are any less dragonflights. In fact, the infinite dragonflight provides with, you know, a lot of problems. They they really do cause a lot of harm within the world of Warcraft. But all of these dragonflights, the five specifically, is said to have been the result of pure selection. When Tyr saw how incredibly good the five dragonflights were at taking down Galakrond, he went to the other keepers and he tried to convince them that we should make them powerful so that they in turn can defend Azeroth. Odin of course did not like this because Odin thought that he and his warriors will be the ones to defend Azeroth. 
but you know, this is not about Odin, even though Odin may have had a point. Uh, Tyr manages to convince all of the other keepers and in turn they go to the Titans and the Titans decide to bestow their power on the five dragon flights. Now, this is where things get interesting because the rumor, the rumor that the dragon flights themselves believe uh, and perpetuate is that they were born from Galakrond. This is, of course, the the work of Tyr and some of the Watchers who explain to the Dragonflights that this is the lie, the aspect rather, uh, that this is the lie that they should tell their flights so that no one ever attempts to do what Galakrond had done. Shame. Feels more like shame. Now, this is where we sort of go into the speculation bit, where I think we may, we may be misled by the original stories of the Dragonflights. I believe that Titan interference were very much present, not only within the creation of the Dragonflights, but actually within the creation of Galakron himself. See, I'm, I'm not convinced that Galakron himself would just have come to the realization that eating another Protodrake may have been a good idea. The fact that the Titan Keepers were so incredibly willing to lie about what had happened to Galakrond and how the Dragonflights were born does not make obvious sense to me. Shame makes more sense in this instance. Tyr and the other Watchers were interfering with Galakrond's development. They were the ones who made him eat it. Why? Well, I believe if you look at the history of the Titans, they have a rich history on Azeroth. We're not even going to Draenor, by the way. Just Azeroth, of interfering and playing around with the cosmological forces, Sholazar Basin, Ngoro Crater, Uldir and Gahoon, Ulduar. You have so many forges and engines on Azeroth, so many dungeons that showcases the interference of the Titans and then playing around with different cosmological forces, you know, trying to get just the right thing. One thing that's very interesting to me is that the Titans seem obsessed with this interference or this creation of a void creature trying to introduce void but in such a way that maybe they're trying to control it maybe they're trying to figure out how do you control something that has void inside of it the story of galakrond can serve one of two purposes the first the titans are directly responsible for galakrond and they created him the second after seeing what had happened to galakrond realizing that the introduction of Void and Fell into Galakrond drove him mad. Titans ultimately decided that something has to be done about Azeroth. Now remember, Azeroth is Void corrupted already. When you do the fight in Ulduar with Algalon, Algalon tells you that the planet is already too corrupted and that the only step from here on out is re-origination. In other words, rewind time, set it all back, quite a bit. So we know that Azeroth is already corrupted. We also know that the Titans fear this void corruption. I in fact believe that the Titans and Zuval fear exactly the same thing. A Titan waking up corrupted by the void. This is why the Titans consistently conduct their experiments. Trying to figure out if a creature is already corrupted by the void, how do you reverse it or contain it? Because the biggest fear right now for the Titans has to be if Azeroth wakes up now with even a slither of void corruption within her, there's no stopping Azeroth. They've seen the evidence. They've seen what Galakron did with just a just consuming the void. What had happened to uh, Galakrond. They've seen what had happened to Gahoon. They've seen what had happened to Deathwing. Every single time Void gets its tendrils into a creature, nightmare and corruption ensues and devastation on an incredible scale ensues. So the Titans start experimenting. Zuval, for his part, has the exact same fear. And we know this because of what the Nathrezine told Sargeras. Remember, the Nathrezim were under the direct orders of Mr. Zuval himself. They told Sargeras that this is what the old gods are after, corrupting a titan and turning said titan into a void titan, a titan that would ultimately be unstoppable. 
The only difference between Zuval and the Titans are their approach. I don't believe that Zuval is looking to dominate the whole universe simply for the fact of domination. Zuval is trying to shut down Azeroth, and I'll use literally his own fight mechanics. Throughout the entire fight in uh, of, against Zuval, he consistently tries to kill Azeroth. He could try to, you know, start the reorigination domination process. Instead, no. He keeps shooting bolts at Azeroth that the players have to soak. If uh, if they don't, Azeroth dies. Why is that? It's simple. Zuval does not believe that Azeroth should ever be allowed to wake up. The Titans, for their part, believe that balance is the key. They don't believe that you can keep the Void out. The Void is simply too strong. They believe that you can find a balance. This is why Azeroth is an, in an eternal state of slumber, because the Titans have not yet figured out how to get the balance just right. Right now, their forges serve to infuse Azeroth with as many cosmological powers as possible, whilst also keeping her asleep. Very much the same kind of prison that they had every single one of the old gods in. A prison that sustains them, but also keeps them dormant. We know that Azeroth can communicate with us beyond her prison, but she's not at full strength. At least not yet. What the future holds for Azeroth, that is a different story. Azeroth has just been through multiple ordeals. Let's be real. Legion, she got stabbed. BFA, her blood was literally used as a war engine maker. So Azeroth has been through the grind and she was just in a fight against what can, what is considered, or at least as we were told, a Titan plus plus. So Azeroth is boozed, bruised, battered, and broken. What does this mean for our beloved Azeroth, the Void Titan, the normal Titan? Is Azeroth even Titan at all? Ladies and gentlemen, my name, of course, is Aklon. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to hit the like button, hit that subscribe button, and also smash the bell. It does about the channel a lot. Write some stupid shit in the comment section down below. If you want to support this channel more, like these beautiful people is already on the screen is doing, you can hit the link in the description down below. Become a patron. There is exclusive content to you, uh, a podcast every single week, and we're playing around with some Q&As and stuff that's going to be up uh, within the next week or so. So definitely join us over on Patreon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as always, my name is Aklon. Thank you so much for joining me. Please be kind to each other. Be good to each other. And I will see all of you in the next one. Peace out, fam.